Okay, recording. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those that will be uh, watching this uh, offline, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us in this second day of uh, this short course on operating envelopes and their implementation. Uh, right now is the time for block number one of day two, which is actual implementation of operating envelopes in Australia. We have Alex and Liam. Uh, Alex is from Energy Queensland and Liam from uh, SA Power Networks or SAPA as many people know it uh, here in, in Australia. And then they will be presenting each uh, around half an hour in this block. Now, before we start, uh, just let me acknowledge uh, country here. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are on today. So it's, it's beyond the University of Melbourne today, uh, Melbourne, of course. Uh, we now have uh, uh, South Australia as well and Queensland. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So how we are gonna uh, do this uh, in this particular uh, block. So we are gonna have the time, uh, half an hour more or less for Alex, uh, that's including Q&A. So please do write the questions that you might have for Alex there uh, in the QA panel. Uh, we will go through them and at around 9.30, we will continue with uh, Liam and as well, we will go through the Q&A at the very end. So we will have kind of a little stop at around 9.25 there uh, or a little bit early, depending on how the presentation goes and we will go through the questions and then uh, we will do the same for the second half. All right, with that said, let us uh, let me stop uh, sharing my screen and let's move to Alex. Alex, please. Sure thing, let me just share my screen. You see that? Yes, all perfect. Thank awesome. You. Cool. Um, so, quick disclaimer first to say that. Um, so, I'm just going to talk about what we're doing at Ergon and Energex, which is in Queensland. Um, it's still evolving though, so all of the sort of methodologies aren't necessarily representing a um, a firm connection agreement, like connection methodology. Um, it's sort of what we've initially started with, but it's sort of evolving as we go because this is all still reasonably new. So a uh, quick background, uh, we, you would have covered it yesterday if you were in the lectures yesterday, but traditionally export limits have been a static limit that didn't change over time. And we're moving towards a dynamic, which is updated in real time based on the current network constraint, which generally means that customers can export more to the grid than they would have under a static limit. Um, we're also using the term scheduled, I guess, for something halfway between the two, which is sort of like a time of day schedule, but not exactly real time. Um, and of course, it's called a dynamic operating envelope because an envelope has two ends. So in addition to an export limit, you can equally have an import limit on the other side that applies to consuming um, particular loads that it could be controlled. So in Queensland, we don't currently mandate uh, dynamic operating envelopes. They're negotiated, so that means customers can opt into them. Um, reasons they might want to do that is if they want to get more than five kilowatts per phase for their export limit. So the standard basic offering currently is five kilowatt static. Um, so if they want more than that, they could opt into dynamic. Um, if customers are on a constrained part of the network, then they will be offered a nil export contract on that basic connection. So they can enter a negotiated dynamic connection, which would give them 1.5 to 10 kilowatts, um, which is an improvement from zero. Um, but obviously if the network's constrained, they're probably not likely to get the full 10 kilowatts in the middle of the day, um, most of the year, unless there's a PQ monitor installed on that part of the network where we can, um, can base things off the actual real time uh, network constraints. And then the other type of customer that have been signing up for dynamic connections are single phase customers that are installing a battery system. Um, the static limits apply to total inverter size. So if you have an AC coupled inverter of a 10 kilowatt PV, you can't add additional battery to that. Um, but under dynamic, you can have up to 20 kilowatts total. So 10 PV plus 10 battery. And then a new thing that recently came in in Queensland is um, 20 amp loads um, under our connection contract aren't allowed unless they're managed by AFLC. Um, that was recently updated to allow dynamic as an additional option. So instead of using AFLC or ripple control to control um, greater than 20 amp loads such as EV charges, 
um, dynamic is now an option for import control. But the main thing we're talking about today is how we calculate the actual envelope. Um, so we have sort of three main ways, I guess, in, in Queensland. Um, first, we have like a basic scheduled one. So I talked about basically being a time type table and that's where we don't have any telemetry. And that would also be the fullback method. Um, say we lose comms to our PQ monitor. Um, so even if they are in the next one, which is basic telemetry DOE, if we have a transformer monitor, we know exactly how much power is flowing through a transformer and what the voltage is. But if we were to lose comms to that, then we need some sort of fallback method and that would be that scheduled um, DOE. And then finally, we have an external or advanced DOE that could come from any sort of other system that is able to calculate it in a more optimized way. Um, we have something in Queensland working with GridCube called distribution state estimation, um, constrained optimization. So basically it looks at parts of the network that do have transformer monitoring to calculate what the estimated uh, power flows are at all the other points in the network. Um, and that can be used to optimize the DOI. Um, so that could be the, the third advanced um, methodolo methodology and then model free, which um, will be talked about later. So I won't go into that one. Uh, so firstly, what determines the constraint? So we have thermal constraints um, of the transformer nameplate rating. So I mentioned customers that are um, offered nil export. That's generally because there's more PV capacity installed than the transformer rating. So if there's a 100 kVA transformer and we have 120 kilowatts of PV installed, we don't uh, want to allow additional PV capacity to be connected without some sort of control because it, there's a potential if all PV systems are operating at the same time that they will export um, greater than the nameplate rating and damage that transformer. There's conductor rating. So the wires have ratings obviously as well. Voltage issues both on the LV network and upstream on the MV. Protection constraints. So we don't want to be blowing transformer fuses or service fuses. Um, upstream constraints, so we also have constraints obviously at the feeder zone sub transmission and even at the system level, um, things like minimum system demand at the AMO level um, could potentially cause a constraint to cascade down to all the downstream PV systems. And then we have contractual constraints with the customer. So when they sign up with their connection, we'll offer them a minimum maximum limit. So I, I mentioned the example of 1.5 to 10. So we obviously can't um, offer them 1.5 unless it's under emergency situation like AMOS directed, um, because that's like the guarantee that we've given as part of that contract. So for our scheduled um, basic, we, we don't have any idea of what the power flows are on the transformer um, and it can change by season, day of week. So weekdays, weekends, public holidays are different. Um, it's going to be different in different regions. Queensland's a very big state, so Cairns is going to have a very different load profile to Toowoomba, where it's very cold and Cairns is very hot. Um, but what we can do is have a normalised load curve for all of those different situations um, and different parts of the state that sort of show what's a typical worst case day look like for each of those scenarios. So there's an example there of what PV generation looks like in winter versus what it looks like in summer. Um, and they're all top out at one. So it's, it's normalized and then can be scaled up. So if we look at our PV curve and we assume that we, we look at how much installed PV capacity we have, multiply that by that normalized curve, we'll get a curve of what's the worst case generation of all PV systems running at the same time. And that's that blue line there. Conversely for load, we can look at what's the historical max demand and what did the load profile look like on, on that time, time of day for that season of the year and get a profile for what's the worst load. In reality, and that's that red line at the top. The reality is that most days are probably more like that green line where they're um, sort of somewhere in the middle, um, but without having a real time telemetry of the network, obviously we, we're uncertain to predict um, which day there is going to be constraints in, in a particular local area. So we take those two worst case profiles and that can be used to, for forecasting as well. So CSIPOS allows scheduling 
um, operating envelopes into the future. So at five minute intervals for the first hour and then 30 minute intervals for the next 23 hours, um, we can send that through to the devices. And that means that if they lose internet, such as um, their uh, MBN has an outage or something like that, the device won't immediately fall back to the 1.5 default limit. It'll sort of slowly um, taper down towards that safe limit over the 24 hour period. Um, and that allows us to ride through comms outages without suddenly seeing large drops in PV systems, um, but allows the network to operate safely if the Wi-Fi limit, if the wi if they change their Wi-Fi password or something and lose internet, we obviously don't want them to keep running um, at 10 kilowatts unconstrained indefinitely because the network situation could have changed since we last communicated that. So what does that all look like? Um, so for a transformer example here, we have a hundred kilowatt transformer. So that's the uh, orange dotted line is the rating there. We have our two worst case um, profiles for the day. So the, this bottom line here is our worst case PV generation and then this top line is our worst case um, load generation. And then we look at the difference between what is forecast for the load and what the rating is. And that's what we call the headroom. So how much uh, capacity is available in that part of the network. And you can see for this example, there's always headroom available um, at all times of the day. So when the customer envelope is calculated, they basically get their full 10 kilowatts at all times. There's a little bit of a ramping at the start um, and the other thing to note is that the red line of the headroom actually extends past the 100 kilowatts of the rating down to 150. And that's because we over allocate. So we don't want to say a, a, a particular PV system can do 10 kilowatts. And then if they don't use it, we're limiting other customers when um, in order to allow that unused potential to be used, we can over allocate unused headroom on the next iteration because it's a control loop. So um, transformers are capable of handling, uh, being overloaded for at 150% for up to an hour. Um, and because DOEs are calculated every five minutes, it's, it's reasonably safe to over allocate up to, for example, 150% and then correct it on the next iteration when the data comes through. Um, another way of protecting um, for that over allocation limit is to not increase things too much. So we don't want to jump up and down too quickly. Um, so we rate limit the amount that DOEs can increase in each five minute interval. And that also prevents um, hunting and over allocation where like the system won't be operating than it is. And so it's sort of everything, the voltage and everything jumps around heaps. So we had our headroom and then we had an envelope, but how did we convert the headroom to an envelope? And um, you probably have seen a very similar slide to this yesterday. It's taken from an AMO report, but there was um, this particular example was, was shown yesterday as well. Um, but just pulling out three of those examples, I think they had um, eight or something. But if we look at equal proportional and maximize export, under maximize export, you get the most capacity out of all the customers DER. Um, so 19 kilowatts, but the customers at the end of the line basically don't get to export at all. And the ones at the start get to export everything, which isn't necessarily equitable unless there's some sort of compensation, um, which doesn't currently exist in the regulation rules. Um, so while it Im improves renewable uptake and, and export, it's, it's not seen as fair. The other way to do it would be uh, equally divided up, up to a limit um, that reduces the total amount of renewable generation, um, but it's a lot simpler to implement. So it's technically easier for us to do. Um, it favors smaller systems because the larger systems are being curtailed more, but it is sort of like inherently equitable. And then another one, um, which was called, um, some people say this is more equitable It's based on the system size. I would actually dispute that because it's sort of like pay to play then. Um, the larger the system is, the more export you get, which means the more money you have, the more the larger system the buy, the more export you can get. So sort of penalizes people that can only afford smaller systems. 
Um, but there's a lot of work in uh, needs to be done in customer engagement, obviously, to see which of these or, or there's other methodologies as well is ultimately going to win. So we're going with equal as now because I said it's the technically easiest to implement and reasonably equitable, but there needs to be a lot more work um, engaging with customers to find out which one they would prefer ultimately um, and whether there's mechanisms to say, use the maximum export one um, and potentially compensate these customers at the end of line um, in order to make that more, more fairer for customers. And just to give an example of what that might look like for an example transformer, so under equal allocation, um, where the transform is heavily overlaid, everyone basically gets um, limited to 7.3, except for um, some existing fixed connections, which just always get five or 1.5, whatever their contract is. So their existing customers, they get just the same limit all the time, but it is less than they would potentially have got under a dynamic. Um, and then as capacity opens up, more customers get unrestricted. Um, proportional, basically everyone's all restricted at the same time time um, but uh, larger systems get more. Now I mentioned that there could be voltage constraints as well. Um, we can manage that with basic as well because under CSIP OZ customers are required to send back their telemetry so even if we don't have a PQ monitor customers can send back their voltages and we're just doing a simple um, throttling basically once the voltage goes outside some limit then we start reducing the headroom available um, and therefore the envelopes for those customers um, to and, until the voltage comes back within limits again. So taking that same example again, but making it a little bit more interesting so that there actually is a constraint. Um, so we've increased our forecast load and generation just in this example. So there's still plenty of headroom in the morning. So the customer gets their full export and import capacity in the morning. And then from about 8.30, um, you can see that the forecast PV generation actually crosses the, um, the rating and so the headroom disappears um, and that causes the over allocation to stop. So we, we are then only allocating at 100% and that results in the customer's envelope being curtailed from 10 kilowatts to 5 kilowatt export, um, basically during PV generation hours. Um, and then a similar thing on the load side where their import limit would be reduced in the evening. That is where we don't have any PQ monitor. If we do have a PQ monitor, then we don't have to worry about our worst case profile. We know exactly what the transformer loading is. Um, so they may still get curtailed. So in this example, they might still be curtailed in the middle of the day um, and a tiny bit on the load side in the evening. But generally, if they have a PQ monitor, because we have to be less conservative with our assumptions, because we know what's happening in the network, they are going to be curtailed for a significantly less portion of the day and therefore the year as well. Um, so when is the scheduled fallback method useful? Um, if it's, the network's not constrained, obviously, there's not much to calculate. There's plenty of headroom at all time. They just get their full envelope all the time. And that uses a lot less compute than things like model free or processing transformer monitoring. So if we don't have um, high PV penetration on network, then it can make sense from a compute point of view to um, use the, the basic methodology. Um, if we don't have an LV network model available, then it makes things difficult to do state estimation, although that is where model free becomes an option. Um, and if we don't have PQ monitors, then obviously that, that means we can't do real-time analysis anyway. And regardless of all those, unless we have really good short-term forecasting of transformers, which we aren't quite at yet, um, it can be used as a way of forecasting that 24-hour profile. And if the network's still constrained, which for Queensland is only about 1.7% um, of transformers are at that limit where the transformer's constrained, um, we can install a PQ monitor to reduce the amount of time that they're constrained. We could upgrade to something like an external or advanced dose or model free um, if, we, if we don't have a PQ monitor. And then ultimately um, augmenting the network or upgrading the transformer is always an option as well, although a costly option and takes, takes time to do. Um, that's mostly all I've got. I do have this one bonus slide to show that um, there is some work 
so that's I talked about work on the network side, but there's also work that can happen on the customer side as well. So this is an example of a customer. Uh, uh, the data has changed slightly, but it's based off a real example where the customer has a battery that's set to consume, uh, to start charging as soon as PV is available, basically, and they're on a constrained network. So they get limited in the middle of the day from like 11 till 3, and then um, they get curtailed, so they're losing PV generation. But if they were to shift their battery, so instead of charging at six o'clock when the sun comes up, they're charged in the middle of the day, they could export in the morning, so get export credits in the morning, then charge their battery in the middle of the day and not be curtailed, and then export again in the evening and significantly reduce their, the amount of generation. So they would still actually have a tiny little bit of um, sort of wasted PV, I guess, but significantly less, and then significantly less against, again, than there was static. So. Um, I guess this was just an example to show the, the power for the customer of operating envelopes, of keeping the network happy, but also keeping the customer happy, um, especially if they have something like battery and EV charger where they can be quite flexible in their load. So I'll jump into questions now. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Alex, thank you very much for that. And I just wanted to everyone to reflect uh, from, from the presentations that we did yesterday and the different challenges that we were mentioning. Those are the challenges. So in the case of Energy Queensland, there's a limited availability of monitoring, smart meters, access to smart meters. So there are many decisions that need to be made. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that operating envelopes cannot exist. Clearly they are doing it, but many other considerations need to be taken on board. And of course, there will be some limitations in terms of the accuracy and you know how much actually we can use uh, the existing infrastructure because of the lack of certain inputs. But still, it is possible, and, and it's fantastic that you're sharing this with us, Alex. Yes, uh, let's go to the to the questions. Uh, can you see the, the pop-up window? Yeah, there? yeah, I can read it. Excellent. So the first question is about PQ monitor installation and who pays for it, where the customer does. The answer is the, the network will pay for it. We have some funding in our AR submission to install PQ monitors, um, and we will try to target their location based on where there is trends like high PV penetrations. So we already have been doing that. So it'll be installed at the network's expense, but ultimately that is the customer's expense, obviously, because customers are paying network charges. Um, but we try to target it um, in areas where it's going to be most useful. And I mentioned state estimation and model free, and they are alternative options because it, it's going to cost too much money to put a PQ monitor on every transformer. But once you have about 25% transformer monitor coverage on a feeder, you can do things like state estimation, or if you have a high percentage of smart meter data, then you can do model free as well. So PQ monitors aren't always going to be the right answer, um, but that they're one, one tool that we can use. Thanks for that. Next. Um, and that ties nicely into the next question, which is around, don't smart meters give you the necessary data as well? Yes, they do, but we don't have much of visibility of smart meter data currently. Hopefully that should improve with the AMC review, um, giving networks access to that data um, in the future and requiring 100% smart meter data by 2030. So in 10 years time, yes, it will. Um, but right now we only have like 10% smart meter coverage in Queensland. Um, so it's, it's not enough to, to, to provide that. Um, so where are some cases when the protection constraints have limited the operating envelope um, or is limiting criteria always thermal or voltage related? So for um, LV networks, it's going to be mostly um, thermal or voltage related currently. Um, there is some feeders that have constraints, like upstream feeder constraints, but probably not um, protection. I did see a further question down um, about community batteries. So we do have a similar process. So where community batteries fit in was another question. Um, we have a similar process planned for MV connections or community batteries where they'll also receive received OE and they're generally going to be connected at the feeder. So they're going to be dealing with feeder level constraints rather than distribution transformer constraints. But the process basically applies all the way. Wherever the constraint is, you do some monitoring. If it's a thermal constraint, you do some monitoring of the um, what the power flow is through the point of the constraint and reduce um, the envelopes until the constraint's no longer being exceeded. Um, and that can be at any point in the network, really. Um, proposed reses, will they consider oversized transformers to enable export options for residential PV? Um, 
so the if a if a transformer's overloaded with PV or um, load, it can be triggered for augmentation, but that process is obviously quite slow. Like it takes a long time to plan work to upgrade transformers. Um, but the whole point of operating envelopes, I guess, from a, keeping electricity prices down is to um, reduce that need for augmentation. So if we can, instead of upgrading a transformer at, at great cost to us and then therefore the customer, um, if the, if the customers only need to be curtailed for like one day of the year if the constraints only in one day a year it probably makes more sense just to reduce the pv on that one day of the year because that's not that much in export um money but significant dollars in transform augmentation but if the um, customers on the transformer are being curtailed like every single day then obviously it, it would absolutely make sense to um to upgrade the the point of the network so i guess the answer was it would depend uh, analysis done for owner occupier to rental properties. Um, I guess the beauty of the dynamic operating envelopes, I guess, is it, it's sort of agnostic to um, whether it's a commercial customer, residential, doesn't really matter. It's, it's purely a network based constraint saying this is what the network can handle at one time. Um, it's no different to what we've always done, except for we've just had to be conservative in the past and say this is. Um, the worst case day so that's the most you can have now we can say well that's the most you can have on that one particular day but the rest of the year you can you can have a lot more than that um could proportional based oh sorry the question just moved on me um proportional allocation be biased to favor small systems yeah so there's a lot of work that can be done on how to best allocate on the lv side i think but um Ultimately, I guess we need to do some engagement work with customers to find out what they they want, and that probably needs to be done on a national level as well, so that we can we can be consistent. And I know that AR is planning to release a um, like an allocation principles guideline shortly, which hopefully will provide some guidance on that. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different options. Um, good quality Pokemon is very expensive. Yeah, so we're just using five minute. Um, so the question is what type of Pokemon monitoring are we using? We're using five minute voltage and um, power or well, voltage and current, um, but specifically what the, the real power and reactive power is and the voltage um, and, and, and five minute intervals. So not waveform data or anything like that. Um, how many customers do we have in flexible exports? Um, so we call it dynamic connections in Queensland, but we have roughly 500 currently um, signed up. Um, and at the moment, I mentioned that is an opt-in basis. So um, we're not sort of pushing that hard, um, but we expect that to increase significantly over time as sort of the technology improves and um, inverter support improves. Um, how does the import limit work? It's not limiting uncontrolled only battery charging. I do have a slide in case someone asked a question about that. So um, just a quick CSIP Oz uh, background is uh, we can publish site limits which apply at the connection point um, and the metering is done at the connection point and the customer can have managed generation, managed load and unmanaged load. We don't allow unmanaged generation in, a, um, in our connection agreement, but in theory, I guess you could have that as well. And you can send limits at the site um, and that can be managed by say increasing or decreasing your unmanaged load. Um, or we can send um, controls at the device level, which would generally just be used for backstop purposes. Um, but what that looks like in practice is that traditional loads like lighting and everything are counted as unmanaged loads. So then they're not required to be um, controlled, obviously. So um, a PV would be required to curtail if it was going to exceed the export limit, but import limits are allowed. So the site import, lim site import can exceed the import limit as long as managed loads are not consuming at that time. So if your aircon and your cooking and your lighting and everything is all running um, and you're exceeding the, ex the import limit of say four kilowatts, just with that traditional load, 
that's allowed as long as you're not charging your battery and charging your EV charger at the same time. Um, and you can offset that. So if your PV was generating, then you can sort of, ex you can charge your EV charger as, as quickly as you want, as long as you have PV to offset it. Um, likewise, you can turn traditional loads off to increase your load. Um, so import is a little bit more complicated, I guess, um, because of that complication of unmanaged versus managed load. But um, to answer the question, import limits only apply to managed loads. However, unmanaged loads can impact how that is applied. And with that, thank you very much, Alex, for answering the questions so well. I mean, there are a few more questions that first are popping up. Feel free to answer them uh, by typing things. Although chat, I, I know they take, uh, it takes a while, though, but you know, <laughs> I was doing that yesterday and it takes a little bit. But uh, if you stick around, that would be great because then uh, if we have some time, you can answer some of these questions as well. Now we move to Lian. Thanks, thanks again, Alex. Lian, can you please share your screen? No worries at all. <laughs> There you go. Thank you very much. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that fine. Yes, all good. No worries. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone. Um, so as Nanda said, my name is Liam Alam. I'm a future networks engineer with SA Power Network. So essentially my job role involves two things. Number one, I look after all of our um, hosting capacity, modeling, calculations, and also operational systems that calculate all of our dynamic operating envelopes in SA. And I also look after, from a regulatory perspective, our strategies and investments for what's the future of operating envelopes and flexibility in SA. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of DOEs in SA. Um, we actually started on this journey back in 2017, really. We started doing a bit of brainstorming in this area. Um, and in 2019, we launched an arena-funded project uh, with Tesla and the CSIRO, which is called Advanced VPP Grid Integration. What this was, was it was us working with Tesla to generate and communicate DOEs to a thousand Tesla Powerwall 2 batteries that were operating as part of a state government funded VPP. Uh, communication of these DOEs was actually via a bespoke SAP into Tesla API that we created. And these export limits went from five kilowatts to 10 kilowatts. So we let these batteries double their export limit. Um, and this was kind of the first real demonstration we'd done of a DOE. Fast forward to about 2021. And we launched another arena project, this time with uh, fellow DNSP Osnet, as well as three major solar inverter manufacturers, Fronius, SMA, and SolarEdge, and then a tech provider switched in. So this was moving away from DOEs for batteries and looking at what about DOEs for PV inverters, and as well moving away from this bespoke API that we'd been using previously and looking to see what's a standard way to communicate these DOEs. And this is just kind of the birth of, of the CCPOS um, communications profile that we've discussed a bit. This was used on 400 residential customers, this trial. Um, these customers weren't offered any free inverters or financial incentives, just a higher export limit. We then fast forward to last year, 2023, kind of when this all happened at scale, and um, we had the SA government publish what's called the Dynamic Exports Guideline. And this is really the birth of the at scale flexible exports program in SA. It's actually an update to some legislation, so the law in South Australia, and it requires every new PV inverter that's installed in the state to be capable of receiving a DOE via CCPOS. It doesn't have to actually be receiving one, but it has to be capable of doing so. And it also gives SAPN uh, power to set DOE cybersecurity requirements in SA. So as we said, our flexible exports, our DOE program, sorry, is uh, called Flexible Exports in SA. Um, and this is now the standard connection offer for all new PV in large parts of the state. So currently, um, it's the default or opt-out, not opt-in, it's opt-out, offer for 188,000 customers as of today. And by the end of the year, um, it will be available to all customers in SA. So more than 900,000 plus customers have the option um, of going on a flexible export limit when they install. Mm -hmm. So how many do we actually have live? Well, we've got about 1,700 customers who are right now receiving a DOE every 15 minutes. Um, we've got 1,200 more systems that are installed and waiting on the solar installer to go and uh, commission them uh, for a DOE. So you'll note that it's only available to you know 20% of all of our customers currently. And this is because we actually roll out our DOE eligibility in a staged uh, manner. 
So we first looked at, well, where are the most constrained, the areas of the network with the most PV and where we most need a DOE to help us out, rolled it out there first, and then we're expanding to the rest of the state. And the reason why we're doing this is because opening this up to all customers essentially inundates our call center and engineering teams with uh, support issues. And it just helps us to manage the customer experience, massive amounts of engagement with solar retailers, installers, and inverter manufacturers, and lots and lots of technical compliance issues with the receipt of a DOE, which we'll discuss a lot more as we go along. So it's been very successful so far. As we said, we've got uh, coming up on almost 3,000 uh, systems that are approved and shortly to receive a DOE. So in areas where you can get flexible exports, 86% of customers are choosing to do so as opposed to going back to a fixed 1.5 kilowatt limit. So the vast majority of customers are choosing to go on a DOE program, which we're very happy with. 99% of the time in those areas thus far, the export limits have either been at 10 kilowatts or at the system size, as in if they have an 8 kilowatt inverter, we'll send them 8, we won't send them 10. Um, so they haven't been constrained much, but that 1% of the time when we've really needed to constrain them, we've been able to. Overall, it's about 2.25 times more energy that these customers have been able to export um, over the lifespan of their system thus far, as opposed to going on a st static limit. And the vast majority of customers are happy. So we do customer surveys, customer interviews to see how do you feel about flexible exports? Would you stay on? And 85% of customers have said, yes, they like it and they want to continue. So I won't go too much into the tech because Nando and the team and Alex have done a great job of covering that, but I'll touch a little bit on it. Um, Alex noted that Energy Queensland's DOEs are a five minute frequency. Ours are 15 minutes in SA. And it's all based on site level load and PV forecasts. When we say site level, we mean NIMI level, household level, home level forecasts. We then build up these forecasts up to a transformer um, and we calculate all of our network capacity at that low voltage or street transformer level. So we constrain at that transformer level, primarily in SA based on voltage. So the vast majority and really the whole driver behind us uh, designing and creating flexible exports was to manage voltage issues, over voltage issues in South Australia. We do have thermal issues as well, but to a far lesser extent, 99% of our issues are all voltage based. So we calculate the available network capacity as in how much room do we have left before we hit a voltage constraint at that low voltage transformer level. And we then allocate that capacity down to individual flexible exports homes beneath. So how do we allocate that? There's been a lot of discussion about capacity allocation, um, which you do it very similarly to how Alex described in Queensland. Um, we call it the waterline allocation approach, but what it really means is we do equal allocation. So we divide the capacity equally amongst all flexible systems under that transformer. And if some of them have been over allocated, so if we've given eight kilowatts to a five kilowatt system, we'll return that unused capacity back to a pool and then reallocate. So it's kind of a loop that cycles through in a 15 minute forecast and tries to perfectly allocate all of the capacity. So nothing's wasted. We communicate these limits to a site. So we don't communicate to, we don't calculate, you know, an in, a device level DOE or export limit, not to an inverter, to a site. So it applies to any devices that are operating at that house. So we communicate these to a CCPOS client. Um, and if there are multiple devices behind the meter, so if you do have multiple PV inverters or a PV inverter and a battery installed, excuse me, behind that meter, um, then that can be mediated. So there's kind of a sub allocation of capacity in the home. So we allocate network capacity to a home and then a CCPOS client can allocate the capacity it's given to devices behind the meter where the technology exists to do so. So that's kind of the current state. Um, I'll touch a little bit on where we're going on flexible exports and then, you know, also closing the other side of the DOE, flexible imports, which is obviously a very hot topic. So currently flexible exports, it only covers residential and commercial PV um, up to 200 kilowatts and only things that are connected to our low voltage uh, 400 volt network. This isn't to say though that we don't have a need for DOEs at the higher level. We do have export constraints across large parts of our HG network. And this goes right up to our connection to our transmission operator in SA. We have constraints essentially from the 400 volt network all the way up to where we meet the 132 kV network. And these do impact all customers below. 
So we don't have any capability yet to uh, dispatch a DOE to these systems. We will soon, and we'll look to mediate, you know, the capacity on the network between these substation level constraints and rooftop PV using a tiered approach. So what we mean by that is we essentially look at all the large generators under a substation, we proportionally allocate capacity to them, so based on their system size, and we treat all this aggregated rooftop PV as one large generator. So it will get proportionally turned down, and then the capacity that's allocated to that group of PV is then um, uh, sub-allocated, we'll say, using uh, an equal allocation approach. So this is something that we're designing and we hope to deploy uh, at scale later this year. On flexible imports as well, um, something we are very interested in and are actively working towards. So as some on the call may be aware, um, as a network, we operate in five-year funding and development cycles, essentially. Um, so our next regulatory period begins July next year. And we have a, quite a large program in here. It's about $8 million, which is called our Demand Flexibility Program. Um, really, the gist of this is it's us asking for funding from the regulator to calculate and dispatch flexible import limits to all customers the same way we do for flexible exports. We've actually started a bit early. We're already building the tech to do so, um, and hopefully we'll be demonstrating it in the near future. So watch this space. And we won't dive into this too much because it's an absolute can of worms, but to us, flexible import limits will be opt-in per device. So if you want your battery to be flexible, but you don't want your EV to be flexible, we want to enable you to do so. And it has to be reward-based. It's not opt-out like flexible exports. It is opt-in and you will have some reward for opting in and helping the network, be it a reduced tariff, be it a financial payment. Um, that's yet to be determined, but to us, pricing and how you reward the customer for being flexible with their imports is absolutely the key. So we'll touch now on a few challenges. Um, we've had many, we'll go through five. <laughs> um, so number one for us was really all about, from a tech side, how do we standardize the communications protocols that we use to communicate a DOE to site? So if you remember, I said that our first trial of DOEs was with Tesla, um, an arena trial where we used, we created a new API just between us and Tesla, it wasn't suitable to be used anywhere else. We said, well, we want this to become a statewide or a national thing, ideally. So how do we do it? Well, we actually need a single standardized way to communicate between a DNSP and all devices behind a, uh, on a site at a home. So we did a bit of a scan globally. And really the leader in this space was the IEEE 2030.5 standard. And the reason it was the leader is because it was already mandated for interoperability between a network and the site in California under Rule 21. So California, obviously, absolutely huge player in the energy space and uh, often setting international precedents. So California had mandated IEEE 2030.5 capability implemented via what was called the Common Smart Inverter Protocol, uh, Profile, sorry, or CSIP. We took a look at that and we said, well, CSIP and 2030.5 are great, but they're all about device level. So sending a control to an inverter, not to a site, not accounting for multiple devices at a home. So we uh, led a working group um, facilitated by the Australian National University to design or to adapt CSIP into what we call CSIP OZ, which has been discussed at length in this program. CSIP OZ basically adds site level controls to CSIP. And it's now actually become, so this was originally an arena document. Um, it's now uh, progressed to the point where it's a standards Australia handbook. So it's on its way to becoming an Australian standard. CSIP OZ has progressed so far that it's now a legal requirement for all new PV inverters installed in SA and Victoria. And as Alex has said, it's also the enabling technology behind uh, Queensland's dynamic connections. So that's standardizing communications from a network to a home. But what about within the home? What about multiple devices talking to each other to be able to properly mediate the capacity they have from an export or import limit, like we discussed earlier? So we call this behind the meter interoperability. And to us, this is the Wild West. This is what needs sorting out right now. And this is the next frontier. So as we said, DOEs, they're calculated at the household level. Multiple devices, in theory, can and should respond to that DOE. But in practice, only one does. And it's because devices behind the meter, they can't talk to each other. There is no standard communications protocols for one device to talk to another. Um, which means that in practice, 
you can't or we don't see sites where EV charging or battery charging ramps up to meet an export limit. Instead, PV generation just turns down. We want to enable this, and so we really want to focus on standardizing communications behind the meter, which to us maximizes the value we have from sending a DOE to a site. We'll really increase that site's ability to respond to network conditions. One other challenge we'd love to talk about is uh, the legal side of DOE. So if we actually wanted DOEs to become a thing at scale, well, we needed to make sure as many devices as possible could communicate over standard comms protocol. We spoke about the birth of CCIP OZ and why we chose that. But how do we actually make sure that devices can speak CCIP OZ? Well, the answer is we needed some legislation. We needed some laws to do so. So we worked with the SA government to implement what's called the Dynamic Exports Guideline, which is essentially a law, um, or it's a technical <laughs> regulation, um, that mandated all new inverters installed in SA uh, as of July last year did support CCIP OZ. This has been delayed uh, six months to a year. Um, basically, the industry wasn't quite ready. We were trying to bring everyone along a little too fast. Solar retailers, so the companies selling solar systems, they really needed to be educated on how does a DOE work? What is flexible exports? And how do I explain that? How do I sell that to a customer? Solar installers, so the people on the ground installing and commissioning these systems, they needed to be trained on how to install them, how to commission them. It's a huge change from what they've been doing before. And also solar inverter manufacturers all around the world, um, they needed time to develop their CCPOS clients. They needed to test them and they needed to be certified by us, which we'll talk about soon. It's important to note that inverter manufacturers aren't Australian. They are typically Chinese, German, Israeli, um, Austrian. They are all over the globe. We're not really working with Australian parties here. We're working with global manufacturers. So this was a success, this guideline, this law. Um, it's now been repeated in Victoria uh, the under the Solar Homes program uh, as of this month, I believe. It's now mandated in Victoria, CCPOS capability, but there is no national requirement yet. We hope there will be one day, but there's not just at the moment. So once we have standardized a comms protocol, we know CCPOS is the way to go. We have a law that says everything must speak CCPOS, must communicate over CCPOS, how can we actually be sure? How can we test that? How do we know that an inverter doesn't have a faulty implementation? And the answer to us is we need to test and we need to certify these equipment. So we don't test every single inverter. We test every model, every series of inverter. So we have developed what we call a development and integration server, which is basically a test CCPOS server that we provide to any equipment manufacturer over the globe who wants to have a space where they can develop and test CCPOS in a safe or a development environment. Once they've done that and they have a working CCPOS client, uh, our team at SA Power Networks and tests and certifies that equipment, that's basically to make sure it can properly receive and interpret a CCPOS DOE. So we work with their engineers to witness their capabilities. Um, once we're happy with it, we tick it off, we certify it, and the Clean Energy Council, which is a peak body in Australia, um, maintains a database for us of all the equipment that we have certified. And this database is used to say what can be installed in SA and now what can be installed in Victoria. So this is all still done by us, by a small team at SA Power Networks, um, but we're working towards a national and more scalable approach to doing this testing and certification process. Just as far as how many have been done, it is almost the entire market. Slides a little outdated now. It's more like 99%. Um, almost every inverter that you can buy does have this capability of communicating a DOE over CCPOS, and every one of them has been tested and certified by SA Power Networks. Um, and as we said, this is working with manufacturers all over the globe, um, as well as some aggregators or tech providers that are Australian based. I'll be quick, but another very significant challenge um, that we have faced is compliance. So as we said, we've standardized communications. We have a law that makes sure all inverters can speak that standard comms protocol. We have a testing and certification process to make sure they have developed that capability correctly. There's no bugs in their software essentially. But then what about the installation? How do we actually make sure that all these boxes are ticked and that it's solar installers are installing these properly. They are properly connecting to our DOE servers such that their system can receive, 
interpret and apply a DOE accurately. Compliance is an absolutely huge and very costly issue. So if everything's done right, there's no issues. However, incorrect installation. So things like uh, not, prop not uh, properly uh, installing an export meter on the solid, reversing your metering polarity, incorrect firmware updates from the manufacturer after we've already certified them, and often tampering with the system as well, mean that a lot of sites that should be responding to a DOE, they don't. They breach all of our export limits and cause more issues for us. To try and tackle this, uh, we actually developed what we call the capability test. This is an automated test and it tests the installation um, before we let it actually connect and start receiving a true DOE um, by applying some sample CCFOS control. So basically tests that, you know, we've already tested that theoretically the inverter can receive a control. We're now testing it's been properly connected to our server once installed on the customer's site, it's properly connected to the customer's internet, and it's been registered with us. Uh, this is a single button test for an installer, um, which really simplifies that commissioning process. We've also run for years uh, training sessions with solar installers and solar retailers and manufacturers. And we do this via um, peak bodies such as the Smart Energy Council and the Clean Energy Council. We also have an entire team dedicated to customer support um, or installer support, we should say, um, for those installing DOE systems. And we also have a team of operational engineers whose main job is to support um, installers, solar retailers, and inverter manufacturers in commissioning, testing, and certifying their systems. And I think I've hit my 20 minutes, but our very last slide is just talking about another challenge which often goes unspoken, but the cost. DOEs are great and the cost benefit is very high. However, they are expensive. So all of our initial flexible exports work was funded by a $30 million, $32 million program from 2020 to 2025. We're now proposing another $80 million on CER integration as a whole um, from 2025 to 2030. About $40 million of that is directly related to flexible exports, compliance, and the use of smart meter data excuse me, the use of smart meter data. So we could essentially say that $30 million previously, another 40 soon to come. It's a $70 million program overall. And this has really fed massive amounts of IT development, huge cloud architecture. All of our work is supported by Microsoft Azure. Um, huge volumes of smart meter data storage, processing analytics, and also years of work um, with state governments, federal governments, uh, universities, CSIRO, other networks, and then engagement, as we said, with inverter manufacturers and customers and installers. And that is a huge amount of time that we spent and money has gone there. As we said, though, the benefits here far outweigh the costs if we think the alternative is just building out a bigger network. And we're talking hundreds of millions as opposed to 50 to 70 million. We also, um, in 2021, led a rule change, um, which was called the Access and Pricing Rule Change. So it's a change to the national electricity rules. Um, which aims to simplify and make it a bit easier for networks in the future to get funding like we have to really build these DOE programs at scale. And that's it. That's me. Sorry for going shortly over time, Nando. But, uh... that, that was perfect, Liam. I, uh, I mean, to, to you and to Alex, I, I was smiling throughout of the presentations that you guys put together because it's, it's, it's so cool to see, uh, great to see, not just the, the concepts and the, the theory behind what we were presenting yesterday and all about operating inputs and flexible export limits, but uh, you guys bring in, you know, the, the, the actual implementation of these operating envelopes and all the different challenges that go beyond just the concept. The concept, at the end of the day, I hope that most people attending this, this webinars, this course, uh, they will get it, right? But implementing it, it depends on many, many other factors. And... Uh, it's not easy. And thanks, thanks for sharing all of these, all those challenges. And the history as well behind, you know, what we have right now in Australia. Well, let's go to some questions. Uh, Liam, uh, the, the first question is actually from, I don't know where you have the, the panel there open. It's yep, from I do. Alan, Alan Luke at mm -hmm. 941. So you can start from there. No worries at all. So Alan's asked about the waterline allocation. Is it done on a per site or per phase per site? And the answer, Alan, is it's done per phase per site. So a three phase site gets 15 kilowatts a single phase site gets five kilowatts in your example. So, yep. Um, Fernando has asked about if the operating envelopes are calculated based on HV voltage issues. 
can customer voltage issue voltages go over 253 so um constraining systems based on high voltage constraints as in uh you know 33 kV or 66 kV networks are in the works we don't have that capability yet all of our limits are sent such that the customer voltages stay below 253 so the answer is no if we are correctly calculating a DOE and a system correctly applies it, it is designed so that their voltages don't go above 253. Uh, Peter has asked, does your DOE algorithm incorporate live Bureau of Meteorology data? Yes. So weather data is the a key input, I will say. So we have live 15-minute weather forecasts. We ingest from a weather zone API, which links back to, to the bomb. Um, so yeah, we have solar insulation and temperature forecasts every 15 minutes that update our DOEs. Um, an interesting one here from someone anonymous, but how is SAPN incentivizing the customer for curtailing their solar exports? Is that done by the retailer or the aggregator? So, you know, we don't pay customers for turning them down. Um, the benefit for the customer here is that for the vast majority of the time, they've doubled their export limit. Before they used to have five, um, now they can have up to 10, and the vast majority of the time they can have 10. We do also have um, an arena project that we are currently running, um, which is where we're working with retailers to use our CCPOS connection to site to turn down um, inverters due to negative wholesale price, where the retailer then pays um, the customer for doing so. So it's really looking at that interaction between the market side and the network side and how it can deliver more benefits for customers. Uh, Ramon has asked, what about the PV inverters installed before July 2023? Um, so they don't need to be capable um, of receiving a DOE, DOE. Some and a lot were um, kind of between 22 to 23, but yeah, they didn't need to. It's only new inverters. Uh, an interesting one here from Caitlin. Um, if the customer system doesn't pass the capability test, whose responsibility is it? Um, and who do they contact? So as far as who they contact, well, we have a dedicated team, a dedicated custom support line uh, with engineering support as well to manage these installations. So they can ring us essentially. As far as whose responsibility it is, it is not the customer's responsibility. It is the solar installer's responsibility. Um, vast majority of the time, it's an installation that's been performed incorrectly. So we will help the installer to rectify that. Um, and where there is an issue with the device itself, we will then mediate between the installer and the in inverter manufacturer who typically is overseas and we take that responsibility on. Um, Fee has asked if all customers sign up to DOEs, will the DOEs be the same for most of the time? So early adopters get to export 10 kilowatts sooner and more often and so benefit more. So this is quite an interesting question because where we are at the moment is actually that on a given transformer where we do have a flexible exports customer, probably only one or two are flexible. And so actually these customers are taking the brunt of the constraints. Um, so these customers are actually getting more heavily constrained now than they might be if all of their neighbors were under a DOE. So the answer is that the magnitude, so the frequency at which we're constraining um, a transformer or systems under a transformer does not change as you get more DOE systems under that transformer but the magnitude of those constraints actually reduces. So the more DOE systems we have under a transformer, the better, the less each one is constrained because there's more customers to share that capacity across. And uh, Leon, just because of time, we will need to stop here. Thank you very much for answering the questions. Thank you everyone that were raising the questions. Very interesting question. Actually, as a matter of fact, we will be discussing some of those aspects of investment, uh, what happens in the future with DOEs uh, in the next block, actually, as a matter of fact. Uh, Alex, again, thank you very much. Leon, thank you very much. It's just so great to have your inputs and uh, this, this very open and, and frank uh, knowledge sharing that you have done. And uh, well, to everyone, again, uh, remember, Energy Queensland and, and SAP and are, are the two uh, distribution companies here in Australia that are actually doing it. And others are gearing up for that. It's not that they are you know, waiting a, a lot of time. They are gearing up for that. And it's extremely exciting what is happening here in Australia. Again, thank you very much. And we're going to stop the recording now. And in a couple of minutes, we continue with the next block. Thank you, everyone.